Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the Moss Landing Marine Labs seminar series. Uh, I'm Amanda Kahn and on behalf of the Invertebrate Ecology Lab today, we'd like to welcome you all and our speaker, Dr. Michelle Akladis. So really quickly, uh, before we start, how this online seminar will work is that all audience participants will be muted throughout the seminar. Please do not attempt to turn on your video or share your screen during the talk. There will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions live at the end of the talk, just like a normal seminar. So once the speaker has finished her talk, you can use Zoom's raise hand feature to notify me that you'd like to ask the speaker a question. And the raise hand feature is located under the participants tab at the top of the Zoom window. Also, if you're available, uh, please remember or please think of sticking around after the seminar as well. So Dr. Akletis is available to stay around afterwards for a more informal happy hour and discussion following her talk and the question period. So with that, I would like to introduce Dr. Michelle Akletis. She grew up in and obtained her bachelor's degree at the University of Crete. She did her master's in oceanography at the University of Amsterdam and then her PhD at the University of Queensland in the Coral Reef Ecosystems Group, where she studied sponges that bore into corals on the Great Barrier Reef. She's now a postdoc with the California Academy of Sciences, but is residing in Curaçao for her research in collaboration with the local research foundation, Karmabi. Her research is focused on coral excavating sponges. She's used various methods to study interactions between the sponge and its symbionts and the role of symbionts in their ability to erode corals. And she's now using genomic tools to study the spread of coral excavating sponges on the reefs of Curaçao. So I was really lucky to see a snippet of Dr. Akhlatis' work at the World Sponge Conference a few years ago. And I'm very much looking forward to her talk which I am sure will make coral excavating or boring sponges seem anything but boring. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Akletis as she presents her talk about photosymbiotic sponges and the erosion of coral reefs. All right, thank you very much, Amanda. And thanks so much for inviting me uh, to be here this afternoon with all of you. Welcome everyone and thanks for being here. Um, so today I want to talk to you uh, about a peculiar type of sponges, so bioeroding sponges. And what I'll do is, uh, I guess I'm going to bring together two big topics, uh, bioerosion on the one hand, and photosymbiosis, or the symbiosis between animals and photosynthetic microorganisms on the other hand. Um, so I'll talk in detail about the two. Um, but I'll focus on how actually my interest in bioerosion resulted in an even stronger interest in photosymbiosis. So I'm going to integrate uh, some of the work I did for my PhD uh, with some experiments I did immediately thereafter. Uh, and I'll also talk at the end a bit about my current research, uh, which I've been doing through Cal Academy, uh, but remotely uh, here on Curaçao, uh, where I'm talking to you from at the moment. The slide did not progress, sorry. Hmm, my screen seems to be frozen, unless you can see a new slide. No, sorry, it looks like it's frozen here too. Sorry about that. Okay, maybe I'll just stop the share and restart that. Okay, there we go. I hope it doesn't freeze again. All right, so before I, I get into the topic, I'd actually like to uh, zoom out a bit and talk about photosymbiosis in a broader context. Uh, starting with some patterns in the animal kingdom, which I find quite um, amusing or intriguing uh, from an evolutionary point of view. 
So if we if we look at the constant struggle for food on land, um, it's easy to distinguish most consumers or animals uh, from producers or plants. Uh, and there's a few exceptions to this, uh, such as carnivorous plants, for example, that both photosynthesize and feed heterotrophically. Um, but as this audience will know, underwater, such exceptions are actually the norm when it comes to benthic organisms. Uh, so underwater, the boundary between consumers and producers is often blurred. And that's because uh, we have various animals here that form symbiosis with photosynthetic microbes. Now, these animals cannot move, uh, and so they trap whatever might wash their way, meaning that photosymbiosis is extra nutrition for them, and that's a huge uh, evolutionary advantage. Now, this adaptation um, is commonly attributed to the lack of food or the lack of nutrients in the water. And I have a little video here. Mm. which doesn't seem to want to play. Anyway, that video is not playing. But essentially what it shows is um, the crystal clear tropical waters uh, above coral reefs. And so these oligotrophic waters, as they are called, they allow a lot of sunlight to penetrate um, and a lot of organisms on the benthos have adapted to take advantage of that. So a famous example of photosymbiosis are corals. So you will have seen the very productive um, oasis that corals form in nutrient poor waters. And this results in um, direct ecosystem services to over half a billion people. So here I'm just showing you a few pictures um, from Heron Island on the Southern Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is where I did um, most of the field work uh, for my PhD. So you'll also be familiar though with coral bleaching, which happens when the photosymbiosis breaks down due to global warming, uh, leading to widespread coral, coral death in recent years, um, as well as uh, really negative predictions uh, for the coming decades. But what about photosymbiosis in sponges? Now, sponges are textbook examples of filter feeding consumers, and they're actually celebrated for their heterotrophic efficiency. We know also that they host um, vast populations of heterotrophic microbes that are very important for them, but we know relatively much less about their photosynthetic symbionts. And so a couple of years ago, uh, when I first realized that the sponge I chose as a model for the bioerosion experiments of my PhD, um, when I realized that that sponge was symbiotic with photosynthetic microbes, I honestly didn't really think much of it. And so today I want to uh, take you a bit on a uh, personal journey to illustrate how my research on sponge bioerosion really sparked my interest in photosymbiosis in the first place. So first, let's talk a bit about um, bioerosion and about calcium carbonate balances on coral reefs. So at the heart of carbonate coral reefs is really this um, balance between processes that on the one hand accumulate calcium carbonate. So think of coral calcification or calcification by various microalgae. Um, and on the other hand, processes that remove calcium carbonate. So physical erosion due to storm damage or wave action, but also biologically driven erosion, uh, which is called bioerosion. And so while healthy reefs um, maintain sort of a balance um, uh, between this erosion on the one hand and the accumulation of calcium carbonate on the other hand, uh, ocean warming and acidification have the potential to tip the balance towards net erosion. And this is uh, thought to occur because uh, various sets of organisms um, and also some processes benefit from the changed conditions at the expense of others. Now, one of the perceived winners under future scenarios are excavating or boring sponges, uh, which are also one of the major groups of calcium carbonate eroders on the reef. Uh, here you can see a few examples of such sponges together with the corals that they are uh, eroding. And um, so typically these sponges don't have a rigid 3D structure of their own. And so instead, they sort of hijack 
the skeletons of corals and live inside them. And so while they are responsible for processes such as creating a lot of the sand we find on tropical beaches or creating microhabitat for other, um, other small organisms on the reef, they often also kill the coral uh, in the process. So I just want to show you a little bit more about um, how this bioerosion happens. So once the sponges find uh, or happen to settle on a, um, a part of the coral colony where there is no live coral tissue, they will start boring into the skeleton and then they'll attack uh, the coral underneath where the coral doesn't have defense mechanisms and there are no nematocysts underneath. And so the sponge can really easily outcompete the coral in that way. It continues to grow under and eventually a lot of species, not all species, but a lot of them will also spread over the surface, forming a bit like of an encrusting layer. Uh, on the top. Other sponges will stay entirely endolithic, so they'll be only inside the skeleton and will only have the openings of their pumping systems on the surface to be able to still filter water. Um, so here is uh, another picture of basically what picture two would look like if you would take a cross section and you can see these sort of labyrinths and tunnels that the sponge forms inside the calcium carbonate. And this is a piece of calcium carbonate um, once it has been eroded by a sponge. Now a little bit more about um, how this erosion takes place. So it's, it's thought to be a combination between chemical and mechanical processes. So sponges have these specialized eroding cells that are able to manipulate um, the acidity locally, uh, dissolving the calcium carbonate, but they also extend these pseudopodia as they're called, so they're um, extensions of the cell membrane uh, of the sponge cell that can sort of engulf the calcium carbonate chips and remove them and these get washed out of the sponge through the aquiferous system and they, um, well, they end up as sand on the beach. Um, and so quickly here I just also wanted to point out that these sponges don't only erode corals, they'll erode any structure that is made of calcium carbonate uh, and so they're also actually a pest in aquaculture. Perhaps some of your colleagues at MLML um, will be familiar with them. I, I actually hope they're not because they're really hard to get rid of once they infest uh, mollusks uh, in the tanks. So now in terms of uh, the morphology of, of these sponges, well, um, I guess Amanda stole my joke about the boring sponges, but um, Anyway, I'll leave it up to you to judge their looks in comparison to other sponges. But I just wanted to give credit here to uh, some colleagues to man who managed to get Cleona Tomasi, the sponge you see in this picture. Um, they managed to get that sponge into the, the top 10 most remarkable new marine species from 2019, uh, according to uh, Wern's uh, list. Uh, and so this distinction was given um, not only for its looks, of course, but also uh, for its really fast increasing abundance on the local reefs um, in India, this is, and also for its ecological importance on these reefs. And a similar story in terms of abundance and importance applies to a lot of other sponges uh, of this same genus at various locations around the world. Now, one thing I do find quite interesting about the morphology of these sponges is that it's never the same. And so here you can see um, these brown patches everywhere. They are all the same one boring sponge, um, Cleona orientalis from the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is also the, the species I used for most of the experiments in my, of my PhD, as you will see. Uh, and so you can see that it takes on all these different forms uh, of the corals that it is eroding. And this is also one of the reasons why often such sponges are, are overlooked in benthic surveys. It's just really hard to spot them. So I hope this video does work. Um, hmm. Oh yeah, there we go. Okay, so here I just wanted to show you um, Cleona orientalis. Um, this has a little piece that is detached, and so you can see what the sponge looks like on the inside, and you can really clearly see this sort of honeycomb structure um, that results from the bioerosion of the sponge. <laughs> 
And so um, you will have also noticed uh, that there was an obvious color change. Um, and so this is because some bioroding sponges, but not all of them, um, some of them host photosynthetic symbionts. Uh, so if we took a cross section of the sponge, this is what it would look like. So we have on the upper, on the upper layer, we have a surface that is really rich um, in geracladium. So this is uh, the genus name of these symbionts. They are dinoflagellates that belong to the family Symbiodiniaceae. Um, so they used to be called Symbiodinium clade G. And so excuse me if I accidentally during the talk still refer to them as Symbiodinium, but now they have a new name, they are Geracladium. And so then moving deeper into the sponge, we come to this yellow layer that you saw. And here is where we find really all the coanocyte chambers, so the feeding structures of the sponge. So most of you will probably be familiar with these cells, but um, basically they have a flagella, the flagella keeps beating, and this creates a sort of a water current uh, through the body of the sponge, uh, which is used for feeding and for respiration, for excretion of wastes, etc. cetera. Um, what I also wanted to quickly point out here is that um, looking at these TEM pictures of the sponge, we don't see a lot of other microbes. And so Leona orientalis is categorized as a low microbial abundance sponge, um, as we call it, um, and that's abbreviated LMA. So um, a lot of studies have shown that vi various bioroding sponges are already on the rise and predicted to do even better in the future. And, and that's mainly due to three reasons. So the first is that with ocean acidification, these sponges can much easier dissolve calcium carbonate. And just the chemistry of it um, happens a lot more efficiently. The second thing is that as corals are being uh, increasingly compromised, these sponges, which seem to suffer less uh, from the same stressors, um, are incre increasingly winning the competition with corals. And the third thing is that they seem to be able to take advantage of eutrophication and um, sort of increase their feeding rates. Now, moving on to the experiments. So the first thing we did uh, during my PhD was to test basically how resilient Leona orientalis is to uh, warming, acidification, and eutrophication. So we set up an experiment where we had three factors. Uh, so temperature, partial pressure of CO2, and we had a factor that we called diet, which was basically an unsupplemented diet and a supplemented diet uh, to sort of simulate uh, the outcomes of eutrophication. Now the temperature and BCO2, we set them at two different levels. We had a present day level, and we also had uh, end of the century uh, summer conditions uh, based on a business as usual CO2 emissions scenario. And so all these factors, um, it was an orthogonal design, meaning that we had all the various combinations of these three factors. We exposed the sponges um, for almost four months to these conditions. Um, and I don't want to go into too much detail here. Well, I'll just quickly say that um, PCO2 overall had mild effects on the sponges. Uh, the supplementation did stimulate bio erosion rates, but overall, all these effects were really overruled by the temperature stress. And so temperature stress caused bleaching, it caused a decrease in growth, decrease in bio erosion, and we also saw uh, quite some mortality of the sponges towards the end of the experiment. So what you see here is a carbon budget that we put together at the time. Uh, so we measured all the carbon that enters the sponge, either through heterotrophy or through autotrophy of the symbiont. We also measured how much the sponges were respiring or how much carbon was uh, drawn into waste. And then at the end of the day, uh, we calculated what was left uh, for growth and bioerosion of the sponges. And so as you can see here, uh, what was clear is that all the sponges that were exposed to the elevated temperature, uh, they bleached and they had a negative carbon budget, meaning that they were slowly um, eating up their reserves and starving themselves, basically. So, so the result of this experiment was really that um, the role of 
such sponges on future reefs will probably be less aggressive uh, than that predicted for bioeroding sponges that do not have photosymbionts. Uh, but for me, most importantly, what really struck me here was that importance of the symbiosis, that the health of the symbiosis was really equal to the health of the sponge itself. And so these results really beg the question of whether bioerosion is really driven by the photosynthesis of the symbiont, just like we, we see with coral calcification. So now thinking of this purely uh, in terms of the chemistry, it, it appears paradoxical because photosynthesis decreases acidity due to the uptake of CO2, but erosion requires uh, acidity. And so uh, we did another experiment uh, where we manipulated either the photosynthetic activity of the symbionts, we basically blocked photosynthesis using a herbicide that is specific to the photosystem chain. Um, and we also had a treatment where we decreased the populations of the symbionts uh, inside the sponge using temperature stress. Then we let the sponges recover and then we measured the bioerosion rates both during the day uh, and during the night. And so this figure is a bit complicated. There's all these different parameters that we measured. But the main message here that I want to tell you is that uh, we found that basically uh, the more photosynthesis there was, the more bioerosion. And this also applied to nighttime. So the more uh, the, photo the sponges were able to, or the symbionts were able to photosynthesize during the day, the more they also eroded at night. And so this implied that there was some sort of uh, energy storage uh, for nighttime use. And so thinking of this paradox, we could exclude um, the temporal separation between photosynthesis and erosion, right? Because we saw both co-occurring in the light. Um, and instead, we, we suggest that there is more uh, of a spatial separation between the two processes, photosynthesis being really in the upper layer and bioerosion uh, happening deeper uh, inside the sponge. Nevertheless, uh, while we did find this correlation between photosynthesis and bioerosion, it doesn't necessarily imply causation, right? So we wanted to look into this even uh, deeper. So the next thing we did is we designed an experiment where we could track whether the photosynthates produced by the symbionts uh, are shared with the host. So to do this, we needed a way to track basically the fate of food inside an animal. And so how do you do that? And so, I mean, imagine you eat something and you want to know exactly where that ends up in your body. So the first thing you need is a good way to label uh, what you ate so that you can distinguish it from all the pre-existing material in your body. And so stable isotopes are a great tool for that um, because you can eat something that will contain a rare isotope of a certain element and so you know that when you find it back in your body, it's because of the food that you ate. And so that's exactly the principle that we applied to the sponges. So we sampled them, uh, we incubated them in the lab in water that was enriched uh, in a heavy isotope of carbon and a heavy isotope of nitrogen contained in inorganic uh, sources. So that's the 13C and 15N that you see here. Um, so these inorganics, they are ready to be used in photosynthesis, but the animal cells of the sponge cannot readily use them themselves. Uh, so after a certain pulse or sort of a, the duration of the exposure uh, to these labeled sources, we remove the sponges into natural seawater. And then throughout this whole process, we take tissue samples. Now, in order to track the fate of that label, the second thing you need is a, a really good method to visualize where the label ends up in the tissue. And so there are standard ways of doing this where you basically um, make a smoothie of the tissue and then you use a spectrometer that will um, distinguish the different isotopes from each other based on, based on their weight and their charge. But we wanted a method where we could keep the tissue intact because we really wanted to see in all detail whether uh, the label moved from the symbionts to the host. And so instead we used uh, nanosims, uh, which is a, 
a technology that allows that. So what we do is instead of making a smoothie of the tissue, we take sections of the tissue. Um, here you can see it's basically electron microscopy sections. Uh, you can see also all the little dots are the symbionts um, inside the sponge. Then we put them on these special grids and these grids go into this fancy machine, which was actually, I mean, credit goes to physicists for this machine. It was designed to make, um, uh, or basically to, to study meteorites and stardust, but now it's also being used in biology. So inside this machine, what happens is that there is a, a very strong um, positive ion beam. So this beam sort of blasts the surface of the sample and it uh, extracts iron by iron the whole surface, it sort of scratches the surface away. Um, but it does that while keeping um, the spatial coordinates basically of every iron um, that it scratches off. Now these ions go through, through sort of a tunnel, it's, it's in a, uh, with a magnetic field and at the end, they get uh, separated from each other on these detectors based again on mass and charge, just like in a, in a simple spectrometer. And so what you get on the other end are these uh, different pictures, basically. You can still see um, the, the tissue structure. So you see these cells here, um, but you can, you can distinguish where each isotope is. Now, the next step is to overlay these pictures. And so, for example, here we have overlaid uh, the 13C signal over the 12C signal. Uh, and then you make these, these heat maps where basically you start at uh, natural abundance, which is uh, sort of um, on the rainbow scale, it's in blue. And you can go all the way uh, up to pink, which is really highly enriched. And so you can, you can see here that the label that we used really ended up in these symbiont cells. And so that confirmed that um, photosynthesis by the symbionts is the source um, of entry of these labels uh, into the symbiosis. So that was something that uh, we expected, but let's have a look at the rest of the results. Um, so just quickly to explain this graph. So in the first column here, you see again the TM images. So these are the symbiont cells again, and these are the different time points of the experiment. Now in the next column, you can see that we are able um, to select areas of the tissue that we are really interested in. So we might select the symbiont cell, we might select the remainder of the sponge cell that hosts the symbiont. So the symbionts are hosted inside sponge cells. And then in these two last columns, you can see the signal of the nitrogen enrichment and the carbon enrichment. And the top row, you see no signal because this was before we gave the label. And so this is just natural uh, abundance. And so we replicated this for tens of areas inside the tissue. And we were able to show that over time, uh, the food decreased in the symbiont cells, but it increased, so it moved uh, to the sponge cells. So we basically showed that the hypothesis of symbiont sharing with its host uh, also holds for sponges. Um, and so I thought this was quite an interesting result because on coral reefs, we often associate uh, the symbiodiniatia symbionts with coral growth and the building of reefs. And that sort of gives them in some way a positive connotation. And so the fact that uh, symbionts from the same family contribute to the exact opposite process on coral reefs, so decalcification of corals, um, is quite a nice reminder, I guess, that you know, the evolution of these symbioses has, has no end purpose. And it's only in our eyes that we categorize these processes as being positive or um, negative. So moving on, uh, having shown the sharing from the symbiont to the host, we were also interested in whether the host is also sharing with the symbiont. So we did a similar experiment again with nanosins. Um, this time though, we used the labeled organic source. So only the sponge can take this up in the first instance. And uh, we found that um, um, nitrogen rich waste products of the host, such as ammonia, 
uh, were sort of intercepted by the symbionts on their way out. So instead of being excreted as waste, they were recycled within the symbiosis uh, by the symbionts. Um, but in this experiment, what we also did is uh, that we targeted the filter feeding cells of the sponges. So the ones that are deeper inside the sponge in that yellow area. Uh, so here you can see uh, the coanocyte chambers um, of the sponge, and you might recognize the individual coanocyte cells. And we found that uh, a lot of these coanocytes uh, assimilated very strongly the nitrogen um, and also the carbon, even though the carbon was concentrated in what we called uh, small hot spots. So we can zoom in and have a closer look um, at these uh, hotspots. So here again, you can see coanocyte chambers, the TM picture that corresponds to them. Uh, and the second column is zoomed in. So you can see the individual coanocytes and uh, the nitrogen label that is sort of spread out throughout the whole cell, whereas the carbon label is uh, more concentrated uh, in these hotspots. Um, I guess now these results were uh, particularly interesting um, because the food source that we gave the sponges was not a particulate food source, but it was a dissolved food source. And so some of you might be familiar with this concept uh, of the sponge loop, but for those of you who aren't, I'm just going to quickly explain uh, why this was an interesting result. And so um, Dissolved organic matter is uh, a really big fraction of organic matter in the ocean, but commonly adult benthic organisms um, do not seem to be able to take it up in uh, meaningful quantities. So microbes can, uh, we've known that already for very long, they recycle it through what is called the microbial loop. But then some recent work has shown that sponges can too, to some extent. Uh, and in fact, for some sponges, the dissolved uh, organic matter seems to be the primary food source for their diet. So this sponge loop theory uh, predicts that sponges take up dissolved matter, they turn it into biomass or detritus or other forms that reef organisms can feed on. And in that way, the energy sort of gets cycled instead of just hanging there in the water column and not being used by anyone. However, sponges contain a lot of microbes, and so perhaps that's why they can take up DON. Uh, but these results uh, here, together with results from uh, other experiments of other colleagues, uh, show that the sponge cells themselves, the coanocytes really, uh, do also have the capacity to directly incorporate DON, um, even without the help of microbes. And so remember that this sponge was a low microbial abundance sponge uh, in the first place. So uh, coming back to the photosynthesis bioerosion link. So now through this nanosims experiment um, or the previous experiment, we had visual evidence for the translocation from the symbiont to the host. Um, but this was not necessarily related to bioerosion. So we still didn't know why photosynthesis leads to elevated bioerosion. And so after my PhD, uh, I moved to Curaçao, where I worked a little more on these questions using a different sponge species. Uh, but it's really similar in many ways. It's also photosymbiotic. It's also bioerosion. Um, so this time, I set up an experiment to uh, disentangle uh, the impact of the two main sources of photosynthesis. Uh, so oxygen production and photosynthate production. Uh, I wanted to distinguish the impact of those two on the bioerosion rates. So we did this experiment where in the dark, we simulated one by one these outcomes of photosynthesis uh, using uh, glycerol and uh, oxygenation of the water. Um, and what we found was that both glycerol and oxygen were really important uh, for driving the bioerosion rates. And so we now think that the link between uh, photosynthesis and bioerosion is due to both oxygen and photosynthate uh, supply by the symbiont during uh, normal conditions. And so to summarize all of this work, uh, these studies 
sort of made clear how symbionts can affect the physiology of their hosts. Uh, so in this case, the dinoflagellates inside the bioerodin sponges. And this also uh, affects in turn uh, the ability of the host to do all sorts of activities such as excavation. Um, and so this also has an influence on the competition between sponges and corals or the nearby environment uh, and leading up all the way to um, calcium carbonate effects um, or basically um, influencing the calcium carbonate balance at the ecosystem level. So this is a, a sort of a classic um, but not so well known example of what is called ecosystem nestedness. So in ecological theory, um, this um, ecosystem nestedness recognizes that ecosystems are really made up of multiple in each other nested levels, all the way down to the microbial level. And so to understand processes that are happening at the ecosystem level, we really need to look, we really need to zoom in uh, to these other levels as well, all the way down to the finest scale. So that's um, the story of how I got interested in photosymbiosis in sponges. And so after all of this work, I uh, recently I have been digging a lot into the literature um, and I've, I've sort of um, been convinced that photosymbiosis is much more complex and diverse in sponges than in any other animals really. Um, and uh, I just want to tell you a little bit more about that. So the studies that have specifically looked at this have found that 55% of sponges uh, in the habitats they examined were photosymbiotic. Um, and these sponges have a global distribution. So we can find photosymbiotic sponges from Russian lakes to tropical coral reefs and all the way down to Antarctica. And in some cases, uh, there are sponge species that show really high primary productivity because of their symbionts. Now, sponges are also the only animals that, together with these complex heterotrophic microbiomes, they also host chlorophytes or diatoms or dinoflagellates or cyanobacteria. Uh, but still, we know very little about the ecophysiology of all of these partnerships. Uh, so I'm really happy to be able to continue uh, to study photosymbiosis in sponges. It's a topic I find really interesting. Uh, and so next year, I'll be starting a new project um, in the Netherlands. And the funding for this project was actually announced just a few hours ago. So I'm really happy about that. So now, um, before coming to an end, I want to show you also some of the work uh, I've been doing at Cal Academy and on Curacao this past year. So this story is uh, still a bit incomplete. Uh, it's work in progress because we've been very much delayed due to the corona pandemic. But at least I can um, sort of share with you what we've done so far and also what we plan uh, to do to uh, finalize this project. So, so far I talked about how um, these sponges are successful at the individual level or at the level of the holobiont, right? So the sponge and its associated microorganisms. Um, but I'm also interested at what makes these sponges so successful at the population level, because we see them spreading really fast. And um, on some Caribbean reefs, for example, here on Curacao, some of these photosynthetic bioroding sponges um, have a really high abundance, uh, up to one individual per square meter on average. Um, and so this sponge I'm showing you here is Cleona caribia. It's actually one of the 10 most common Caribbean sponges, so throughout the Caribbean. <clears throat> it's also a photosymbiotic. It looks very much like Cleona orientalis, but we know very little about how it spreads. And so this year, um, I teamed up with Finn Bongards and the Reefscape Genomics Lab at Cal Academy to do a population genomic study uh, on a very fine scale. So what we did um, is we established uh, all these different survey sites on the south coast of Curacao, where uh, at three different depths, we have established permanent plots, as we call them. They're 25 metres by 2 metres. And within these plots, we've sampled every single Cleona caribia we could find. 
And so just to show you a bit how this looks underwater, maybe this video will play. Yeah, so here you can see me uh, sampling a, a sponge. I have this GoPro on my head and the tubes in the rack are all um, labeled. And so I don't need to um, register anything else about the location of where I got this sample from. Uh, the video records it. And then what we do is we find back the location of these colonies inside 3D reef models that we've made for all of these locations. So how do we make those models? Um, essentially, we have a diver who swims uh, over the, our plots and makes hundreds of photos. Um, and these get stitched together with specialized software and that results in a sort of a 3D reconstruction um, of the benthos. So I just want to show you a little video again of how that um, 3D model looks like once it's completed. Let's see if this one will play. There we go. So um, we can zoom in on these models really to centimeter uh, a scale. Um, so we can identify colonies if we need to. Um, we can do, we can um, um, analyze the benthic composition. We have a scale, you can see it here. And so we can measure uh, distances between different colonies. It's really a map of the benthos and we actually know where every single sponge is uh, that we sample. And so um, using these maps, what we want to do once we have the DNA results, which unfortunately we don't have yet, uh, is we want to link uh, the physical distance of our sponges um, to the genetic distance. And so this will allow us to answer questions about how these sponges reproduce. So is it mainly clonal reproduction or is it sexual reproduction? Uh, it will give us an estimate of how far the larvae disperse. Um, it will give us uh, kinship patterns of the different colonies. Um, so a lot of information um, based on the uh, genomics analysis. Um, and just quickly, what these maps also allow us to do is various other little projects. So for example, at the moment, I'm supervising a master's student who is uh, linking the benthic composition and structural complexity, especially of sponges, um, to the distribution of cryptobenthic fish um, on the reefs of Curacao. So with this, um, I'd like to uh, end the talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming and for listening. And of course, I want to thank um, all my co-authors and collaborators, supervisors over the years. And there's a few people that I've sort of highlighted here. So thanks a lot, and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that talk. That was great. Um, looks like we have a question from Jackson. Um, Jackson, I will unmute you. Oh, really? Yep. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Uh, so I actually, uh, great talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I recently read a paper um, uh, that was about how an invasive sponge in the genus uh, Terpios, uh, it has um, its symbiont is a cyanobacteria, and they use these um, these sort of cotton umbrellas almost basically to stop them from photosynthesizing and spreading. And it didn't seem to harm the corals because it was only a partial reduction in light. Uh, and I was wondering if any experiments like this have been done with the um, Cleona genus, and if that's and if it if they have, has it proven effective or? is it not so effective because the sponges use the same kind of symbionts as the corals? Thank you, Jackson. Um, that's really interesting. So I, I know about these terpio sponges and indeed they have a, a cyanobacterial symbiont. I didn't know there had been efforts to sort of contain them by shading them. Um, and I don't know of such efforts with uh, Cleona sponges. Yeah. What I can think of though is that I think it would be really hard to do that because as opposed to the terpio sponge, these cleona sponges also grow inside the skeleton. 
So, you know, we could sort of go ahead and shade them as much as we want, but they wouldn't care. So probably the surface layer uh, wouldn't survive. Perhaps they would bleach, perhaps they would expel their symbionts, but inside the coral skeleton, they could just still happily grow. And so, um, yeah, I don't think it would be uh, a very effective method uh, in that sense. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. Um, while we're waiting to see if other questions come up, I have a question for you. Um, I'm curious about the carbon hotspots that you showed and how the pattern of carbon distribution was different than the pattern of nitrogen distribution um, in the coanocytes of the sponge. So why why do you think that they're different? Like what mechanistically do you think is happening that would change the pattern of what's spotted with the carbon versus the nitrogen? Yeah, so what we think is happening there, um, we sort of proposed that perhaps uh, the uptake of the DOM by the sponges, by the kinocytes, happens through uh, what they call penocytosis. So it's like, uh, it stands for, well, it means in Greek, <laughs> uh, cell drinking. And so the idea is that uh, these vesicles form on the outer membrane of the sponge and they sort of engulf the liquid and bring it inside and then further, the assimilation happens further uh, inside those hotspots. Now, the difference in the nitrogen and the carbon label, uh, we think has to do also partly to methodological, uh, I guess, limitations. So the issue with the nanosims is that uh, you need to, um, I guess, take your sample through a series of fixations. And some of these don't work as well um, for carbon rich compounds as they do for nitrogen rich compounds. And so nitrogen rich compounds will be preferentially fixed. And so we think that even though all of the material is taken up together, right? And it contains both nitrogen uh, and carbon in these hotspots, when it later gets diluted and spread out throughout the cell, we can still see the nitrogen, but we've lost some of the carbon due to those uh, methodological issues. Cool, interesting. Yeah, uh, I, I had thought about penocytosis too. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 we need more experiments to sort of prove that, but we thought it might be a way that it could explain this pattern that we see. Yeah, and this pattern has been found. So after these studies, the, there's been some more um, nanosim studies done more recently, um, and they found the same thing with these hotspots. So that was quite, quite interesting. And um, yeah, it would be really nice to find a way to figure out how exactly it happens and whether we could, you know, visualize that, that process of penocytosis. Um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, looks like we have another question in the audience from Sally. Um, so you, I am unmuting you. Okay, you should be good to go. Thanks. <clears throat> Hi, um, Michelle, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you. One of the joys of, um, one of the few joys of um, Zoom is I get to hear your talk from Canada. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I'm amazed at how many uh, Cleona, there are a Curacao, and it, that seems like a remarkable number that you're looking at. And do you have any idea of if that's changed? Um, do they have historical or, or recent historical information on on what the abundances were? Because I'm wondering how the community might be changing and what you, what you know about that. Yeah. So it's true, there's a lot of them here and actually too many, like every dive we did sampling that, it was like, oh no, not another. I just didn't have enough time to sample them, you know. Um, but unfortunately, there isn't really much historical data on that. So although there is historical data on uh, how the benthic composition at Curacao has changed, there's actually one of the longest uh, going, ongoing studies Perhaps you're familiar with those papers from uh, Rolf Bach's permanent plots. But anyway, unfortunately, they didn't include specifically these bioeroding sponges. Uh, it's one of the, those things where I feel like perhaps, you know, 40 years ago, 
um, we didn't even sort of note them. We didn't even know they were there, uh, especially when we're talking about um, the species that are really only endolithic. Um, so I don't really have much data to compare to. I know there is studies from elsewhere in the Caribbean um, and they've done sort of time series and looked uh, how the populations have changed and the consensus is that they are increasing in abundance. But um, yeah, the exact rates and all that, I think it's only specific to a few locations and Curacao is not one of them. Hey, um, any more questions from for our speaker? Feel free to use the raise hand function. Um, and uh, I might ask one more uh, just to just to think mechanistically again about now about bioerosion because also that was um, you know it's always been kind of a conundrum of asking about the balance of you know photosynthesis buffering against um, against acidity I guess but then at the same time needing to have that for bioerosion to happen so um, so. I was trying to think about how your experimental design did that. The the inhibitor that inhibited photosynthesis was the idea that that doesn't affect the pH, but it can still happen in the light where other conditions would be the same. Or kind of how did that design kind of work to to tease apart photosynthesis from just changes in pH that you would have. Yeah, so that uh, inhibitor, um, it's actually a, a herbicide or an algicide. And what it does is that it binds to one of the proteins along the photosynthetic chain. And so it blocks photosynthesis. Um, the idea is that it doesn't affect the host in any way, but really only anything photosynthetic. But in saying that, you know, blocking photosynthesis would also mean that um, you know, the, the, the whole photosynthetic reaction is not taking place. And so we don't have that um, uptake of uh, CO2, which we would normally have during active photosynthesis because, yeah, photosynthesis is completely uh, this, uh, inactivated. Yeah. Um, so I guess in that sense, yeah, it does also, um, in comparison to a photosynthetically active sponge, it does also change. It does also affect uh, the pH. Yeah, you're right about that. Definitely. Right, thanks. Thanks for that clarification. Um, well, with that, thank you for the wonderful talk. It was really, really interesting. And, um, oh, we got one more question. Sorry, I see. Um, Jason has a question and then we'll wrap up. Okay, Jason, you should be good to speak. Hi, wonderful talk, enjoyed it very much and was thrilled to learn of the dinoflagellate symbiosis um, in your organism. Was wondering, following on Amanda's question about the DCMU, uh, we've, I've used it in the past as a great way to leach uh, anemones or other cnidarians of their dinoflagellates. Do you see the same, or did you see that effect in your sponges? Do they bleach when you put the DCMU on them? Uh, right, so actually we did expect that it would bleach, but it didn't really. So we did see some loss of the symbiont population. We've, we've quantified that in the paper. I don't remember now off the top of my head how much it was, but it was definitely not uh, total bleaching. That's actually why we added that temperature treatment at the time, because we did really want to um, remove as many symbionts as we could. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, we did use DCMU thinking that, okay, in the coral literature, et cetera, it causes bleaching, so let's hope it will do the same in the sponges, but uh, it didn't. Uh, so it, it seemed like a lot of those symbionts uh, remained inside the sponge, even though they were not actively photosynthesizing. So, you know, perhaps a little bit of a parasitic behavior there. Hmm. Um, one other thing that is different in these uh, sponges compared to corals and perhaps also other um, uh, benthic invertebrates that these dinoflagellates associate with is that um, it seems like the position of the dinoflagellates inside the sponge changes diurnally. 
And so what we see is that uh, during the day, the surface is really dark brown. Um, during the night, though, it, it's really like the symbionts are being retracted deeper into the tissue. And there have been experiments uh, by Christine Schonberg and colleagues who have shown, um, basically using PAM measurements, uh, that this sort of implies um, a, a migration of the symbionts deeper into the tissue. And, and those papers suggested that it might be a form of um, protection from predation of the surface tissues during the night. But we don't really know what's going on there. What is interesting, though, is that this migration also happens uh, when the sponges are stressed due to temperature or light stress. And so in comparison to corals, where you really only have, you know, this really thin layer of tissue on the surface and the symbionts can't, can't escape, you know, they can't escape the light stress, and corals bleach. Um, instead, in these sponges, what we often see is that the surface might be, might look pretty much bleached, but if you slice a little bit deeper, then you suddenly come across this layer of symbiodinium that is sitting there deeper in, sort of sheltered away from the light. Um, so that might also have played a role uh, with, uh, I guess, the fraction of the population of symbiodinium that remained viable inside the sponge when we did the DCMU treatment, mm -hmm. which, which obviously is um, co-occurs with light stress, right? So perhaps that was, might, that might have played a role. Very interesting. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Holy cow, that's super cool and interesting. <laughs> wow. Um, Oh, sorry, Jason. You... Oh, no, I, I, it was, I was just uh, thinking back to what free living dinoflagellates do and, you know, the deep migration at night to pick up nutrients and whether that's a, mm -hmm. an allergy in, in the sponges, too, if they're going more closer to the uh, feeding chambers and able to get more waste that way. Right. That's cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to do some more experiments in the future, thinking a bit more about that, because I also find it quite fascinating that, um, I mean, I understand that the symbionts have a gain in moving away from the light to avoid the heat stress when it really mm -hmm. gets too much. But it's interesting because the symbionts are inside sponge cells. Yeah, so there must be some sort of mechanism there where the host is actively moving them away from the from the surface, which I, I find that fascinating. Like yeah, what sort of look at the cytoskeletal. Uh... <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, it would be interesting to look at the cytoskeleton uh, behavior as you know different times. Exactly. Different. Yeah. What's so that's what I, I want to do. I want to use a, an inhibitor. Uh, sort of an actin inhibitor to sort of stop that migration of the host cells. Because the idea is that they make these pseudopodia and then they can sort of walk away. I want to try to inhibit that and see if they can still migrate or not. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> cool. yeah, I, I, I agree. It's a really interesting uh, phenomenon. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, really cool. <laughs> I feel like we should keep talking about that in the um, informal uh, happy hour moment now too. I have ideas too. Um, nice. So really quick, everyone, uh, I, everyone, I want to thank um, Dr. Akhletis for this really interesting talk. Um, feel free to stick around and um, we'll stop recording and we'll turn on your abilities to unmute yourselves and turn on your videos and, um, and we can chat further. Thanks so much.